Hi there folks and welcome to another episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. You might be asking yourself, why are you back out here by the old 73 Larson? I thought you had this engine running good and all that fun stuff. Well, this is part three. We're going to check out a few things. I got some curiosities, you know, after I ran it. We ran this thing for at least 40 minutes on the hose and, and doing what it's doing. You remember the old oil that was in it? That Going back to episode one where I changed out that uh, caramel, melted caramel looking solution, a caramel looking solution that was loaded with gas. <laughs> well, let's take another quick look at that dipstick one more time now that it's settled, everything's settled down and we had it running for at least 40 minutes and we put the brand new, you know, 30 weight Napa oil in there along with a brand new, well, that's a Napa gold oil filter number 1061. Made in USA. My understanding is the Napa gold is made in the same factory or same, it's a Wix filter. Leave some comments below if you think I'm wrong. I like to be told I'm wrong when I am wrong. So you guys correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Let's pull this dipstick out. And let's just see what we got and take a close look. Let's catch that drop right there. So as you can see, get this in the picture here. It's still full. It's a little dirty. What I fully expected because we had a lot of you know residual stuff left in that engine but now that we've run it through and flushed it if we drained it and filled it one more time we'd have a pretty clean engine inside because you saw the valves they look pretty good there's not a lot of there's no residue and buildup or you know any of that paraffin and things that would be in the old oil in there so that's good news we'll call that a win The other curiosity that I had is how'd the compression do? We had a variety of compression when we started it up, but that could have been from years of sitting and not being, you know, lubricated properly. Because uh, with the gas and oil that was in there, that can't be good on it. Sitting dry, as a, you know, when I checked it, I fogged the cylinders down pretty good, whipped her over a few times, and then came up with a uh, compression um cylinders one through four which was ranging from about 140 to 158 maybe i'm trying to remember which is all within the acceptable parameters i think if you look in the book for this thing the original manual says compression should be around 140 so it met that criteria you know it didn't have a weak what i'd call a weak weak cylinder so i don't have the feeling that i had any stuck rings or rusty rings or bad cylinder walls or something but some people could argue the fact that because I fogged the cylinders down and you know you had lubrication in there it might give you a false compression well we're going to remedy that thought process right now because this has been about 50 some hours since it's ran we're going to pull all the plugs out and we're going to check the compression on each cylinder before we start getting into the process of removing this engine out of this boat for safekeeping it was this close this was this close to ending up in a boat graveyard somewhere deteriorating and rotting yet it still had an awesome heartbeat it still had a donor motor man it was so close so close all right number one what you got One fifty. Number two, what you got? One fifty on the money, baby. Number three, what you got? One forty. Let's call it one forty-five to one forty-seven, maybe. Not bad. What you want to maintain is less than ten percent difference between the cylinders. So you're putting a balanced load on things. Cylinder number four, what you got? 149-ish. Well, I'd call that 110% success. All right, looking at the sparky plugs here. Now, they're a little oily. 
They have never seized on them, plus they're a little oily from when I did the valve adjustment with the cover off and all that oil ran down. And but we're gonna we're gonna clean that off before I stick them back in. But you can see they're running kind of dark. That one has a little bit of light tan, dark, dark. It's black in there. It's keep in mind this might be a little bit rich yet, but I also ran like a 50 to one two stroke mix through this engine to make sure everything was lubricated and doing what it's supposed to do. And not having to, you know, break it back in on dry cylinders. So that's why I did that. We're gonna clean these off with a little brake cleaner and we'll stick them back in. And I think I'm gonna fire it up one more time. Why not? You guys hear that water running in the background? That can only mean one thing. I'm about ready to fire it up again. As long as I put all the spark plugs back in the right spot. Firing order one, three, four, two. There it is. One, three, four, two. One, three, four, two. Ignore the whoever wrote this on here. Must have been looking at it from hanging from a bar upside down and got it wrong. Alrighty. Now I've replaced a lot of this gas in this tank with just plain old regular, no two stroke mix. I'm gonna pump it up a little bit here because last time I ran this, I ran the carburetor dry. I'm not sure how many times it's going to turn over before it kicks, but we're going to go ahead and give it a little. There it is. Choke slam shut. Let's see what it takes to fire it up. Yep. That's it, baby. She's a runner. That's from dead cold. Over 50 hours of sitting. Now I wanted to bring you around this side of the boat so you can see this choke butterfly right here. It's part way shut, but part way open. It just opened up a little bit more. There's heat coming up through this heat riser tube as we described before. Once it starts getting some temperature up in here, it's going to warm up that bimetal spring and have things kind of start to open that choke on up. See it starting to open up there? When she's fully open, that butterfly should be straight up and down. She's just coming right on out there. There she is, straight up and down. Running like a beast. While we're in here, let's check the voltmeter and see how many voltages it is it's putting out on the old alternator. Now you guys might be going, why do you keep putting your hand on that? Intake exhaust manifold. Well, I'll make sure it's not getting too hot. I should be able to put my hand on it without it burning me. 
that tells me everything's working like it should be coolant wise all right let's go get the old voltmeter and see what we got like we got about 15.25 volts hey we got a visitor k6 outdoors is on the house oh, smell some horsepower horsepower baby Move. Whoa! Missed the fender. For those of you that don't know what an accelerator, an accelerator pump does, watch right in this area here. I'm trying to get some. When I give it some gas, you'll see the little squirt. That's that accelerator pump giving that little shot of fuel right down the throat of the thing to keep it from stalling when you're, you know, under acceleration. Now you can see this butterfly is straight up and down. So everything's doing exactly what it should be doing. Now that we've got this thing running very satisfactory and we've checked out a few items to make sure it's functioning properly. Uh, you know, we checked the compression, the compression is you know 140 what was it 148 to 150 i mean it doesn't get any more balanced than that that's incredible and we got the carburetor the automatic chokes doing exactly like we did like it's supposed to do as we set it um we do know that it's running just a little bit rich uh that could be just needing to adjust those idlers those mixture screws just turning them in a little bit leaning it out but i also haven't been running this thing that's at idle uh, full RPM where you got gas flowing a lot of air flowing when you're full throttle on the lake might be a different story That's why I'm not really crazy about changing that right now We'll leave it as is until this is in a boat and we'll able to actually exercise it a little bit better and we'll we'll get it uh, We could finish tuning it up real nice, but yeah, it started a little tougher this morning. It's 60 What? The, how many degrees is it this morning? Let me grab my phone here going on here yeah 58 degrees this morning so it's a little chillier this morning than normal I probably should have gave it like three squirts of gas in there she probably would have popped right off because uh, like you saw at the beginning of the video it was like 80 degrees when I uh, last night when I did this same uh, exercise and she just boom popped right off so uh, but that's the difference between the cold a little bit warmer a little bit colder you know 30 degrees is substantial um, if you don't think so, when this is supposed to be running at 150 and it's running 180, it's running a little warmer than it should. Uh, so 30 degrees does make a heck of a difference on a lot of things. Well, now it's time to get busy pulling this engine out of the boat. Uh, it's, the boat has served its purpose as a delivery device to get this engine into, into the old marina here. But now it's time to preserve the engine and discard the boat because the boat is, I mean, it's a, it was a neat old boat, but, you know, it was not taken care of like it should have been. All right, we're going to start systematically pulling this engine out of the boat. I want you guys to follow along. Uh, I want you to see how easy it is to actually pull a motor out of one of these boats. Now, this one is easier. And the reason I say that is you see where the back of this is right here, the back of the motor's right here. There's a lot of space to come straight up. Now you got some boats where the this back piece comes up and covers up, you know, half of the engine. So you got to actually, you know, get going forward and then get it out and lift it up. Now I'm going to cheat here a little bit. Now, and when I say cheat because I just am. Most boats sit up pretty tall when they're on the trailer and then your cherry pickers that you have don't necessarily go high enough you can remedy that in a couple of ways uh, in this case i've got the wheels pulled off of it and i'm going to take advantage of while i have the wheels off i'm going to set it down on jack stands as close to the ground as i can first thing you got to do is pull the out drive off that's going to take this drive shaft that's going in here and engaged into the engine and pull that out and get it out of the way so i can lift this motor pretty much straight up and once the outdrive's out of the way, I'll be able to lower this on down to the ground, 
which is going to make it a lot easier for my cherry picker to get in here and pluck this thing out of here. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to pull the out drive off. If you haven't seen my videos before on me pulling out drives off, you need to watch this one because I find a lot of boats in the condition. And when I say a lot of boats, the last three or four boats that I've purchased uh, for, for just parts, the out drive has been taken off. And it's sitting there without the outdrive. The outdrive's laying on the ground or laying in the boat because I think people uh, get in over their head a little bit. They pull that outdrive off and they go, ooh, what now? Well, don't be intimidated by that. Yes, it can be kind of intimidating, but it's really not that complicated. The outdrive has six bolts or six studs with six nuts that hold it in place. That's it. And then to split that in half to get to the water pump, there's a one, two, three, four, five, six bolts, I believe, there as well that you've got to split to get to the water pump. And once you split and get to the water pump and then put it back together, it's six bolts back together, six bolts back on the boat. Um, I've done several videos on removing the stern drive, but, you know, it's not that bad. And I'm not sure why some people get out there and they just yank those things off and go, oh, now what? Follow along if you want to you know see how it comes apart i'm not putting this one back together but you'll see how it comes apart and how we get the engine out of here all right one of the first things you have to do in order to remove the out drive is put it in forward gear shift it forward there's a little shifter paw that does like this when you move that shift linkage and it only moves from like here to here that's all the degree of movement it actually from forward to neutral to reverse is about this much movement that's it but you go all the way to forward when you shift into forward gear and it takes that paw that's sitting like this typically in neutral and brings it straight and with it straight allows that stern drive to slip straight off the back that's the first rule i've seen a few of them i've got a few of them here where that little dude is bent over that's so just a, it's a brass shift thing that goes on your spline and it's bent and the only reason i can think it would get bent is because it wasn't in uh, forward, and it was crooked, and people forced it off, pried it off, did whatever, and it's bent. So there may be other reasons it gets bent, but that's the only one I can think of right now. So let's go ahead and put the spark arrestor back on here to keep the critters out of it. And we're going to go up here and put this in forward and pull the stern off of it right now. Step one, shift it into forward. Even into full throttle position, however, make sure it's shifted forward. All right, I lied. There's two more bolts than I thought. I got to take, got to take these uh, shafts off. Need a little more pryage. Save all your washers, don't lose them. Don't lose this shaft. All right, now that those are out of the way, we're gonna exchange our 9 16 socket for a 5 8 socket. I might need my extension, yep. And we're just gonna back these guys right off. Three on each side, three washers on each side. Now a lot of times, let's see if this works this time, a lot of times you can just pick this up and let it drop. And you see it separates right there. From that point, just give it some light bounces, just like I'm doing here, and you can sit there and walk it out. Of 
once you can feel it starting to get real loose. Now normally you can have something you hook right in here. I don't have anything. I'm gonna grab it underneath here. I'm supporting it. But you can use a cherry picker here to help lift it. Once he's out like that, the out drive is removed. What the heck is in here? Where'd that rubber come from? The nice thing is this isn't rusty. So that means everything was dry up in here. It means your gimbal boot just has oil in it and that's it. So we'll set this aside. All right, this is the shaft you're getting pulled out of the engine right here. This is engaging into the engine. And you get this out of the way that allows your engine to be pulled easier. This is the shifter paw I was talking about that's down in here. This little guy here, that's reverse. And that's forward. That's all the movement it really has. So that's why you want to have this thing in forward. So this is straight because there's a little U-shaped channel that this slides into for the shifting. And you want to make sure that's straight. That way you don't bend it when you're pulling it out. Now this is the condition that I discover a lot of boats in, just what you're seeing here. And a lot of people would say, you know, they get, I think they get in over their head and it shouldn't be that big of an issue. Like you, like you just saw there, as easy as that just came apart, I would like to say it goes in just as easy, but it's not quite that easy to put back on. You need two people. It's honestly, it's easier if you have some kind of support underneath the out drive to help guide it in because you got to guide that shaft in and make sure you get everything back in there and all the seals put back in properly. But uh, it takes a little bit, like twice as long to put it back in. As you just saw, it doesn't take that long to pull it apart. And, uh, but I just wanted to share that with you folks. That's, this is how I find a lot of boats. Now, the cool part is right here is where your water's coming in. So if you're ever worried about trying to start this up without the out drive on, you can do it. I've got a little piece of PVC pipe that my hose jams into that I can jam into here and get water flowing. And I can actually circulate water through the engine without the out drive pump, the water pump that's in the out drive. So you can still start a motor up without this being assembled. So don't let that stop you. Matter of fact, I think I've got one that might be in that condition, but we'll get to that later. Later video, I should say. All right. Well, now that we got this pulled off, we can go ahead and start prepping ourselves to pull the engine. We're gonna do that next. All right, folks, we're gonna call it a video. I appreciate your attendance. I appreciate your time and watching. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, thumbs up, you know, all that fun stuff. Don't be afraid to follow the links in the description below. And I'll see you guys on the next video. And here's Michael saying, if it ain't broke, fix it till it is. And enjoy the drone footage at the end of this video. A few of you have complimented me on the enjoying the drone footage at the end. Compliments my son. He's the drone pilot. Does a fantastic job doing it too. So more, let's call it more sneak peeks or more actual just peeks at some of the upcoming videos on another boat that I've been enjoying already. And honestly, we put over 60 miles on it already. So see you guys on the next video. Oh yeah, part four is gonna be snagging this out of here along with the entire wiring harness. And I'm gonna show you what I'm doing to get the trailer back into wheeling shape after the abuse it has been through. Yeah, we're gonna fix these trailer wheels right up. Um, I wanna get this thing as close to the ground as I can for pulling the engine. And I got a little, <laughs> this is gonna look ridiculous, but stay tuned to part four and see the ridiculousness in action.